In this short video, I want to take a brief look at the period of history known as the rise of modern science. Usually this is equated to around the 17th century, although scholars are well aware that the actual development of modern science took place over at least a few centuries prior to the 17th and lasted until some time after. If we give a quick breakdown of some key historical western periods, we usually get something that looks like the middle ages consisting from around the 5th to the 15th century, then the early modern period from about the 15th to the end of the 18th century, then the modern period from about the 19th to the mid 20th century, where from there we shift into postmodernism. Focusing on the early modern period, I wanted to quickly unpack a particular theological consideration that aided in the rise of modern science. Now currently the most widely held opinion about science and religion is that the two fields are in conflict or they're completely separate domains that don't really interact. Now none of these concepts are actually true and virtually all scholars of science and religion instead adopt the idea that science and religion are complex cultural activities and it's very difficult if not impossible to separate the two. Okay so let's quickly get into this topic. The best place to start is probably with Aristotle in order to be able to best see the shift that took place. So for ancient Greeks such as Aristotle, the universe was eternal and unchanging. Aristotle once said that movement can neither come into being nor cease to be, nor can time come into being or cease to be. It was also thought by him that humans had rational minds and so in order to come to understand the universe, we only needed to observe it and then reason about it. Experimentation wasn't really an essential part of science or natural philosophy as it was called up until the 19th century. This was more or less the received wisdom throughout much of the Middle Ages. As medieval historian Edward Grant put it, solutions to problems about the physical world were almost always resolved by appeal to rational and logical arguments. Empiricism served this process only insofar as it provided the ingredients for imaginary thought experiments. But one should never doubt that reason ruled medieval natural philosophy. So what changed to allow the rise of the experimental method? Well, during the period leading to the 17th century, there was a shift in how the Bible was understood. As the reliability of Aristotelian metaphysics was slowly questioned, a more literal understanding of the Bible was subsequently adopted and in consequence, theological concepts were taken more seriously. The idea of the universe as a created entity completely dependent on the will of God was one of a number of factors crucial in establishing the experimental method of science. Roger Coates, who wrote the preface to the second edition of Isaac Newton's Principia, stated that from this fountain, i.e. the will of God, it is that those laws, which we call the laws of nature, have flowed, in which there appear many traces indeed of the most wise contrivance, but not the least shadow of necessity. These therefore we must not seek from uncertain conjectures, but learn them from observations and experiments. The last line is the key point. Coates was essentially saying that, since God created the universe freely via his personal will, the only way to understand how it worked was through experiment. We couldn't just reason about it because there was nothing necessary about it. Equally, in his Boyle lecture, Richard Bentley could say that all the powers of mechanism are dependent on the deity, for gravity, the basis of all mechanism, is not itself mechanical, but the immediate fiat and finger of God and the execution of divine law. Finally, the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge, before Newton took the chair, could also say that the efficient cause of all things is God. Now, to be sure, it wasn't that Christians during the Middle Ages accepted the universe as being eternal. Even during this period, Christians accepted the universe as a created entity by the hand of God. The difference was in how this knowledge was applied. With the loss of the scholastic Aristotelian style of reasoning, a new method of science, i.e. natural philosophy, could be applied, directly based on the implications of the theological claims found in Genesis 1. It seems best to conclude with the words of philosopher Lydia Jaeger, 
who concisely sums up the historical idea of creation in light of experimentation in science. In an article entitled The Contingency of Creation and Modern Science, she states that, thus, creationism considers that the contingent order, that is to say contingent upon God's will, is intelligible, and this provides a foundation for the empirical approach of modern science. For on the one hand, reality can be described scientifically, since it finds its origin in God, who is both omnipotent and rational. On the other hand, rational speculation is not enough to understand the natural order, since the latter is the result of the free act of a transcendent God. Human scientists, as finite beings, cannot, by rational speculation alone, deduce the natural order. They must learn, through their experiments, the laws that God has actually established in creation. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video on the concept of creation and the rise of modern science. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe and I'll be back with more videos soon.